autumn, the only season in which life and death, partings and new beginnings are so close together. A time for goodbyes. The world is preparing for the cold season. For the last time this year, nature offers up its bounty. A plentiful abundance of food that the animals need urgently now. As winter, with all its hardships, lurks just around the corner. But before it finally arrives, nature puts on its most colorful show. And a race against time begins, now in autumn. September sees the start of the year's most dramatic upheaval. It's not always obvious, though. Warm temperatures and sunny days often feel like it's still summer. But the nights are definitely longer and cooler. A signal for animals and plants that times are changing. And there is a tremendous challenge ahead for many. A typical feature of early autumn are the countless silken threads covering fields and trees. They're part of the survival strategy of young spiders, millions of which are now looking for a new habitat. Each spider produces a gossamer flight thread. This enables it to travel for up to hundreds of kilometers driven by the wind. Only a few will survive the journey to prepare for winter in their new quarters. For the red deer, it's a time fraught with urgency, greedy feasting to build up fat reserves, growing a thicker coat, rutting, and all within a few weeks. This means that the mating season in September requires full attention, especially from the dominant stag, he has to keep his harem together and intimidates his rivals loudly. Unlike the does, he has very little time to eat, and by the end of the rut, he's emaciated and exhausted. A myriad insects use the good early autumn weather for a last procreation drive to secure future generations. Some wetlands now become the stage for an important event. The loud arrival of the cranes is unmistakable. They have had to leave their breeding grounds in the far north of Europe. Cold and darkness have already arrived there and they can no longer find food. On their way south, they take a long break in Germany before flying on to southern Europe and North Africa in late autumn. They need a great deal of food to help them cope with the rigors of their upcoming exhausting onward journey. And the harvested fields around their resting places are especially good hunting grounds. Mice, frogs, grains, or plant roots, cranes aren't picky, they just want to fill their stomachs. The wetlands and lakes offer a wide variety of food. It's hardly surprising that countless waterfowl settle here. Large or small, young and old, vegetarian or fish-eating, there's something for everyone here. It's an ideal place to rear chicks and teach them how to forage for themselves.
An abundance of freshwater fish makes it easy to rear young waterfowl here. They generally become independent around the start of autumn. This young great crested grebe hasn't been on its own for long. But it's already learned how to catch fish and also knows that it has to swallow them head first or else the spiny fins get stuck. And the size has to be right too or the fish won't fit down its gullet. You see? There you go. In Central Europe, great crested grebes and coots are known as resident birds, as they can find enough food here even in the cold season. Lapwings, on the other hand, are short distance migrants, stopping over in autumn on their way to the Mediterranean. Only in very mild winters will these climate sensitive birds stay on here. They prefer wet landscapes, such as water's edges or bogs, places where there are plenty of insects, their staple diet. Only at the onset of frost will the flock begin their journey south. Grey geese are actually also migratory birds, but since winters have been getting milder, many of them spend it in Germany. Stay or leave. There are still a few weeks to go before they have to decide. The warm sunny days have ripened the last of the fruit. For humans and animals, it's harvest time. Grapes are true sun lovers. They soak up every ray of warmth so they can reach their optimum sweetness. In the fruit orchards, ripe apples reach their harvest peak. Whatever's left behind by humans generally ends up on the ground. Hedgehogs are more interested in insects, snails, and earthworms. The windfall apples don't interest him. Hedgehogs usually don't indulge in plant matter. Unlike the mouse, it gorges on as much fresh fruit as possible. It will spend most of the winter months below ground, where the only food will be stores of grain and dry plant roots. Even deer are attracted by the plentiful fruit. Although their mouths are not well suited to eating apples, the mother and her almost grown kid eat anything that will provide calories. The same goes for insects, such as wasps and hornets. The fermenting fruit serves as a kind of filling station. The carbohydrates are the fuel that gives them strength. The intensely sweet aroma attracts them in droves. Butterflies, like this admiral, take maximum advantage of this concentrated source of energy. They need reserves for their forthcoming journey to their winter quarters in the south. Not all admirals will take on this long flight. Some also seek out a place in Central Europe to spend the winter. It's a risky decision. They can only survive here if the winter is mild.
Harvest time in the mixed forests begins in late September. The beech trees are heavy with large quantities of nutritious, ripe nuts. In some years, the trees carry an excessive number of beech nuts. The forest turns into a nutritional paradise for its animal inhabitants. Perfect conditions for them to get ready for winter. This intensive fruiting only occurs every few years and produces a vast number of seeds. When ripe, the prickly outer pod opens up within a few days to reveal its treasure. The little beech nuts consist of around 40% fat, high calorie nourishment, especially for rodents and birds. The long awaited forest fruit buffet is open. And the great feast can begin. The squirrel prefers its beech nuts fresh from the tree. It extracts the nut deftly from its shell. The yellow-necked field mouse is in a hurry. Its pantry has to be well stocked for the coming winter. With such an abundant supply of food, the bigger animals are soon drawn to it too. Even deer fortify themselves with the tree's rich bounty. Red deer usually live in herds with strict gender separation. Females and young deer have no antlers. They form and live in doe herds, led by an experienced matriarchal female, the alpha doe. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Now in September, they're joined by the stags. But only the strongest, the dominant male, stays with the does and may mate with them. Despite the rutting season, the animals must still feed themselves up to create fat reserves for winter. A doe eats around 20 kilograms of food a day, which it ruminates. She regurgitates the coarsely chewed food from her rumen, chews and swallows it again. Several times. Only finely processed food pulp reaches the stomach where it's then digested. The doe needs her strength as she's still suckling her young, all being well until the following year. As long as she is well nourished, her fawn has a good chance of survival in its first winter. The same goes for the doe and her fawn in the orchard. There are young foxes in the area. They could pose a danger. The deer keep a wary eye out, just in case. But the playful instincts of these young foxes prevail. They're still much too young and inexperienced to hunt deer. They prefer to watch the doe and her fawn from a safe distance. And they're skittish. Even a little deer hop sends them scuttling.
In September, nature becomes a veritable horn of plenty. Oak trees also have intensive fruiting years. The large quantity of fruit ensures that enough seeds can germinate in the ground and that not everything is consumed beforehand by greedy animals. Squirrels eat almost anything. Berries, bark, nuts, worms, fledglings and eggs. It's using this year's glut of acorns to stockpile for the winter. It checks the acorns one by one. Bad ones are quickly rejected. Acorns are rich in carbohydrates and proteins, little power packs lying around waiting to be gathered. But they do have to keep if they're to fulfill their intended purpose. Each suitable acorn is carefully buried in hundreds of different hiding places. Supplies for the cold period, because the squirrel goes into hibernation, waking up from time to time to eat. Its good sense of smell helps it find the hidden acorns again. But some of them it forgets. These then germinate, making the squirrel one of the forest's most important tree planters. The earth now also reveals its fruits. Mushrooms spring up seemingly from nowhere in just a few days. The visible mushroom caps are only a small part of the whole organism. The main part, the thread-like mycelium mass, proliferates invisibly underground. Fungi love moisture and rain, and there's an increase in both as September advances. From October onwards, autumn often has a fickle face. Low pressure areas spread out across the country, bringing rainfall and even storms. The plant world gratefully absorbs the moisture, while most animals are well protected by fur or feathers. No sooner has the rain passed than normal life resumes once more. The damp forest floor is ideal for mushrooms, as well as slugs. For most slugs, this is their last meal. Unlike other types of snails, they die in autumn, but not before laying their eggs ensuring that the next generation can soon hatch. Hibernators, such as this hedgehog, really have to get a move on now. Before it hides away in its nest at the end of November, it also needs sufficient fat reserves to ensure survival during the long winter. And protein-rich slugs come in handy. There are only another couple of weeks left for the hedgehog to hunt the smaller forest creatures. But while foraging for food tops the list for most of the forest animals in autumn, the dominant stag has other priorities. He repeatedly checks whether a female is ready to mate. As imposing as he may appear, he's not the head of the doe herd. He's more of a tolerated suitor who has beaten the competition. His characteristic bellowing ensures that he maintains the status quo while demonstrating his strength at the same time. His fur has already undergone its seasonal change. The hairs in his winter coat are gray and twice as long as the summer one. The does and fawns are not quite there yet. 
They're still sporting their red, shorter summer coat, but this can change within a week. Eating is at least as important for them as mating, especially with tempting, nutritious chestnuts hanging low on the trees. At an impressive 75 decibels, as loud as a car engine, the stag's bellowing echoes throughout the forest. His tireless campaigning and skirmishing lasts for up to six weeks. A double burden that only the strongest can endure. Autumn is a spectacular time for nature in all ways. Flocks of starlings populate the skies. They're gathering for the convoy to the south. They seek out places in the reeds to sleep where they'll be safe from their enemies at night. Starlings stay in the protection of their murmuration. These number hundreds and sometimes even thousands of birds. The cranes also move from their daytime feeding grounds to the marshlands every evening. They fly in V-shaped formations, with the leader changing regularly. This saves energy, especially over long distances. The watery patches in the marshes offer them shelter when darkness comes. The famous crane dance doesn't only happen during the spring mating season. In other seasons, it also serves to confirm their togetherness. Cranes usually mate for life. They always sleep standing up in shallow water so they can get a head start away from intruding predators like fox or marten. The transition to autumn is usually gradual and goes largely unnoticed by humans at first. But sometimes the change of seasons is sudden, almost overnight. Autumn can be capricious. A cold snap with snow in early October takes plants and animals completely by surprise. Their final winter preparations now have to be speeded up. Many apples and pears haven't even been harvested yet. An early winter onset like this is rare and creates additional stress for the orchard dwellers. The nuthatch hurriedly checks its provisions. Over the past few weeks, it has carefully hoarded seeds and grain under the tree bark. They will safeguard its survival. The snowfall stops as quickly as it began. In October, the sun is still quite strong, and as soon as it reappears, the snow and ice haven't a chance. But this frost was the opening shot. Winter is not far away now. A cold spell, shorter days and longer nights. For the trees, it's a signal to withdraw the precious chlorophyll from their leaves. Broken down into its biological components, it's stored in branches, trunks, and roots, where it's readily available again for new leaves in spring.
With the green gone, other colors appear in the leaves. It was long thought that the red, orange, and yellow leaf colorings were just byproducts of chlorophyll deprivation. But energy is still produced by photosynthesis in the colorful leaves, although in smaller quantities. Anthocyanins, the red pigments, are actually only produced in autumn and have an important role to play. They protect the leaves from the autumn sunshine while ensuring that sunlight can still be converted into energy. Depending on the type of tree and its location, the color spectrum of its leaves can vary enormously. Whether it's an Indian summer in North America, the Momiji in Japan, or a golden autumn in Germany, all over the world this is considered one of the most beautiful times of the year. In the forests, meanwhile, the squirrel is still stockpiling feverishly. Although there's enough food for everyone, as a loner, it will not tolerate competition and energetically defends its territory. Once the intruder is chased away, the squirrel can finally return to its main concern. It buries its treasures in seeming safety. Dig the hole, put in the food, cover it up. The caching procedure is always the same. But its activities are being keenly observed. The jay also buries its winter reserves in the ground. Perhaps that's why it's so interested. The squirrel works tirelessly to secure its winter stocks. But this hiding place is not safe at all. The jay has been watching and steals the treasure. An easy job for the thief, it appears. But will that trick work again? The unsuspecting squirrel carries on storing. and his hiding place is raided once again. Has the industrious collector really not noticed anything? The beneficiary could carry on like this all day. But squirrels are smart. This time, it takes the acorn it's just buried back out of the hole. Unobserved by the jay that's planning to rob the alleged food stash using the usual method. But not this time. The cache is empty. And while the squirrel quietly gets on with burying its supplies, the jay is still digging away fruitlessly for the loot. The winner of this cat and mouse game this time is definitely the squirrel. And the thief ends up empty handed.
In October, temperatures begin to drop further as troughs of low pressure bring in cool air from the Atlantic. At night, temperatures now often drop below zero as the ground frost clearly testifies in the morning. In this colder weather, the mouse now seldom leaves its padded underground nest. But when breakfast is right on the doorstep, it's worth venturing out to replenish one's energy reserves. The cold, damp nights are accompanied by skeins of fog a sure sign that autumn has finally arrived. The fog gathers on the ground, rising as the air warms up. In the cool autumn weather conditions, the moisture in the air condenses on spiders' webs, the perfect way to display nature's transient works of art. Where there's water, the fog is slower to disperse. The grey heron targets fish in shallower waters. Further out on the lake, the mute swans devote themselves to plumage care. They cleanse their feathers with water and then oil them. Their own body's oil protects them from the increasingly cold, damp weather conditions. In the reeds, a blue tit goes hunting for insect larvae that have hidden away in the hollow reed stalks to hibernate. It can hear the caterpillars and maggots inside the stalks accurately pinpointing and extracting its prey. Bearded tits also mainly eat insects, at least most of the year. But in autumn, when large quantities of seeds are ripe, they'll switch to grain as a source of food. In mid-October, the autumn fog lingers persistently, especially in the valleys. Atmospheric inversions can cause a thick sea of cloud. The autumn foliage color change is now at its peak. The fruit has been harvested and all that's left is magnificently colored foliage. There's a final blaze of color before the leaves fall. During the winter, the leaves on the ground will protect the tree roots from the cold. Although it's a radiant farewell to life, it's also a time of great splendor and opulence. Just one of the many contradictions of this season. The heady excitement of the rut is over, as is the eating frenzy. Only the mushrooms benefit from the increasingly wet weather. Most amphibians are now on the lookout for a safe shelter where they can spend the winter in torpor, including the fire salamander.
It finally finds what it's been looking for in a burrow. It will spend the next six months here in an almost motionless state. It is noticeably colder, and by the end of October, leaves begin to collect on the banks of the forest stream. On the ground and in the water, the fallen leaves start to decompose. The dipper has an easy time of it now. It doesn't even have to dive. It simply picks the insects off the leaves and grasses. Freshwater shrimp are a particularly welcome snack. They live off the leaves that the trees are now discarding in large numbers. The piles of leaves provide an ideal habitat for the little crustacea, hideaway and food source in one. The dipper isn't fussy. It will even eat centipedes. It merely wipes off the poison they secrete on its feathers. After that, it's quite safe to eat. These paradisiacal conditions for the dipper don't last long. Once the autumn leaves have rotted and sunk, it has to dive back into the icy water. Golden October mostly lives up to its name. Beech and oak leaves remain on the trees for a long time, forming a protective roof for a while. But the autumn resplendence is coming to an end, and the golden splendor will soon fall to the ground. In the cool, shady forests, the decomposition cycle begins especially quickly. Underwater, it's now even darker and colder. It's the last chance for the trout to stuff themselves with food. They also need fat reserves because they will spend the winter at the bottom of the lake in a kind of torpor. In October, many insect species will often hatch again in the water, the final round of procreation before the parents die or hide away for the winter. These clumsy young insects are now easy prey. especially for trout and other fish. Dragonflies and countless other insects lay their eggs in water to ensure the continued existence of their species. The offspring hibernate as eggs or larvae. The parents, on the other hand, have done their duty and will soon die. Both underwater and on the surface, it's now a race against time. Everyone is trying to prepare for the encroaching winter. The forests become quieter. As it advances, autumn brings with it the cold.
Frost ensures that the last leaves also drop off the trees. It's a protective mechanism for trees so they can survive the winter unscathed. Water evaporates through their leaves, up to as much as 300 liters per tree every day in the summer. In winter, this kind of moisture loss through the leaves would be fatal because much of the rain that falls freezes or remains as snow, so it can no longer seep into the ground to the tree's roots. If they were still losing moisture through their leaves, the trees would die of lack of water. There's only a little fruit left on the bare trees. And it attracts hungry takers. Migrating birds, such as the starlings, feast on the sweet fruit, stocking up on energy for their flight southwards. Anyone staying behind here needs a thick coat. The roe deer have now grown their winter coat. Instead of reddish, it's grayish brown and denser. The individual hairs are hollow, with the air trapped inside, creating a padded, warm insulation. So the deer are protected from the cold, and autumn's bounty means they're well fed. Ideal conditions for the oncoming cold season. While many bird species leave Germany at the end of autumn, this is when others arrive. Migrating birds from the Arctic rest here, and winter visitors from the north and east take up temporary residence here too. Wetlands and lakes that don't freeze over entirely in winter provide them with a perfect winter habitat. Whole groups of goosander families descend on the area, attracted by the rich fish supply. There's a wide selection in these waters. The small fish that populate the shallow waters on warm autumn days are just the right size for the gooseanders. They don't have to dive deep to be successful. The goosander's long curved beak has serrations that enable it to hold its slippery prey so it can be swallowed efficiently. Goosanders are really professional fishing experts. Mallards, on the other hand, don't care much for fish. Their preferred diet consists of smaller aquatic creatures and plants. They can usually reach them easily from the water's surface. Diving ducks, on the other hand, are a less common sight. But when the fish are within such easy reach, they'll also hunt underwater. But how is one supposed to eat the fish once it's caught? Their beaks and gullets aren't designed for this kind of catch. Maybe crunching and shaking it could help? Their beaks aren't really well suited to holding slippery prey, so this drake can snatch it away quite easily. He has trouble with the fish too, but mallards are omnivores and opportunists, and a juicy meal like this will help build up its fat reserves. In winter, the fish will retreat to deeper waters that won't freeze over so easily. 
the grey heron mostly hunts from the shore. It strikes like lightning, grabbing its share in its own rather dramatic manner. Most grey herons stay on in Germany through the winter, foraging in the fields and forests. But as long as the water hasn't frozen over, there's plenty of food for them here. They have to be constantly vigilant. Any rustle in the reeds could signal danger. In the middle of the lake, the heron has no need to fear. The fox's big catch got away. Perhaps he should try fishing himself. There are shoals of fish just below the water's surface. But fishing really isn't one of his strengths. Reed belts at the lake's edge offer many animals shelter and safety. Almost everywhere else, all is bare by early November. Other than human beings, wild boars have no natural enemies in Central Europe. A thicket at the edge of the forest offers them a good lair. They're already wearing their bristly, dark winter coat that's designed to protect them from the cold. Unlike the deer's coat, it's the air between the bristles that creates the insulation which keeps them warm. Boars also benefit in heavily fruit-laden years. They can still find plenty of acorns under the fallen leaves. As omnivores, they can adapt to widely varying conditions. Forests are their preferred habitat, especially those with a damp forest floor. They can slake their thirst in little ponds. and the soft ground is ideal for digging. The damp mud contains an additional source of food for them, including insects, worms and slugs. Swampy areas like this are popular with young and old animals and a fixed part of their daily routine. A lengthy nap in a wallow puddle is an essential factor for any wild boar wellness program. The mud bath also serves to regulate body heat and protect them from biting insects. but clearly not always that effectively. These young animals are around six months old. They're facing the first winter of their lives, but the prospect doesn't seem to make them any less playful. Autumn has come to an end. Nature has made its final preparations, and the animal's hectic activity gradually gives way to a suspenseful calm. It's a time for farewells, farewell to warmth and an abundance of food. The hibernating animals are already ensconced in their frost-proof shelters, and the others have spent the past few weeks making every effort to ensure their survival in the coming months. Well-nourished, 
the cranes are ready for the next long leg of their journey. They are the last to depart from the now bare terrain and head south, leaving behind them a landscape now ready for the onslaught of winter.